First, I wanted to say something about the previous panel we just heard, which I thought was also interesting, like all the other ones we've heard today. I know Kate Torney only through her work, which I've admired, and also her excellent uh, role at the ABC. I know the other panelists personally in various ways. John Barron and I co-taught a course for the U.S. Studies Center, which we had a very good time uh, doing. Robert Schlesinger, I was once the editor of the magazine where he, is, where he now works. That was back in the days when it was a magazine, came out in actual print form, and, and I know all of the challenges that that, uh, that magazine and others have, ha have gone through. Also, I think it's worth mentioning in, uh, that, that um, the, the Atlantic has, has been publishing a very interesting book that's come out just this week in the United States, The Letters of Arthur Schlesinger, and I'm, I'm, I recommend it to all of you. And that book was edited by two other sons of Arthur Schlesinger, one of whom was my college classmate. So it's, I, I recommend that book and other works by Robert Schlesinger. And uh, Jay Newton's fall, I, I hope I was not the only one uh, who I was admiring her comments today as I've admired her reportage over the years. I hope I was not the only person in this audience when she was telling the story about the Hillary Clinton campaign call. And there was somebody on the background giving come on conversations to a young woman. I was hoping the punchline was not going to be knock it off, Bill. It was, <laughs> so that was, that was, that was a, a relief. It shows why I've, I've, uh, I've moved beyond uh, political coverage. Uh, the, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen after this session. We're going to be done by 6.30 this evening. I'm going to go relatively early to questions, trying to involve all of you in what you've heard today, where we can take the, uh, the, the problems we've heard about, the challenges we've heard. When we are done, there's going to be a cocktail party and dinner in the foyer, which everybody is invited to go to. That will go until about 8.30 or so, and please, I hope to see you all there. And from there, everyone is invited to go to the concert hall for a live telecast of ABC's Q&A. Uh, Australians know what a big deal this is. Uh, people who are not Australian will see what, what a big deal it is. Everybody needs to be seated by 9 p.m. there. So just bear in mind, when we're done here, out for cocktails and dinner, and then on to the concert hall for a live showing of ABC. I mentioned also in the beginning of the day's work that the problem of listing people to thank for what has happened here was the risk of uh, offense by omission, which of course is, uh, is, is an offense I, I committed. So I wanted to thank again, in addition to all of those whose hard work over the uh, past year and a half has uh, led to today's events, I want to thank, of course, the two main sponsors, the New South Wales government and the U.S. Studies Center. But in addition to everybody I mentioned before, also Tara Wilson, Catherine McNulty, Susan Beale, Max Holden, Annabelle McGilvray, uh, Jonathan Bradley, and Rob Burdock, who all have worked, worked very hard. Now I'd like to introduce um, three panelists. Uh, I think all of you know them. The Australians certainly know that the figures here. Americans know, know them as, as well. And I'll, I'll call them out, and I'm going to set up the discussion we'll have for our last event of the day. So please join me in welcoming Jay Rosen, Paul Kelly, and Eric Beecher. I'll say a word about each of them. The panel has come out. Jay Rosen, you've heard from earlier today, of course, a very, very influential press critic, press analyst, uh, and, and, uh, and thinker about uh, the press in the United States. Paul Kelly. Uh, you know, as the editor of Large the Australian, a former editor of that paper, one of the most influential and widely followest, uh, followed authors and, uh, and political analysts here. And of course, Eric Beecher, who was the editor of the Sydney Morning Herald at age 33, has, uh, was be, rose to various uh, positions of great influence in the newspaper world and for the last dozen years, has been an online entrepreneur, and now runs the Wheeler Center, I believe, in Melbourne, where we last met a year ago or a year and a half ago or so. So thank you to Jay Rosen, Paul Kelly, and... Eric Beecher. Let me set up a little bit of what we've heard in the last uh, few hours today. I think we've heard a surprising range of opinions about the business of journalism, the practice of journalism, the changing audience for journalism, the forces for betterness and worseness and differentness in the kinds of things we do and the uh, influence it has on, on public life. There are many, many points I heard today that I'm going to reflect upon, not simply about dogs versus cats when it comes to the uh, popularity of, of videos. For example, two panels ago, Jonathan Rausch was pointing out that by one market test, it seems that modern journalism is failing because the audience you know, via advertisers is, is decreasing. But by other market tests of the audience for our work, we've never, journalism has never had as, as broad an influence around the world. And so we're all trying to find ways to, to close that, that, that gap. A question that, that was posed for the existence of this conference at a, as a whole is whether that business challenge for journalism 
the fact that the model that's kept us all in business for the past generation, the fact that that is changing, whether that is of public and political consequence. We've heard different views about that. We've heard arguments, for example, that axiomatically there is no political problem because people will get the information they want and uh, journalism will rise and fall in that way so there can't be a problem. We've heard historical arguments that over the course of democratic uh, governance in America, Australia, and England, there's always been turmoil, there's always been misinformation, so how can that, this be any different now? We've heard about changes for the good and for the bad, suggesting that maybe journalism is beginning to correct itself. We've heard other people suggesting that really there are some deeper problems in how we know, how we judge the information that we need to make uh, public decisions. So I'd like to start by asking each of you to address the basic question of, do you think there is a problem of the information supply for, and I'm gonna suggest greater chumminess with you by moving over here as our photographer is recommending. Is, 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 is there a problem <coughs> to, to deal with? And let me start with, with you, Jay, Jay Rosen. Should we think that the political function of journalism now is worse or merely different from what it's been in the past? Well, I had advance warning you were gonna ask this, so uh, I thought about it, which <laughs> as a college professor is our brand, you know? Um, and I think there are some problems that we should, we should articulate here as we come to a close in this day. Uh, one of them is the legal challenges to doing journalism are on the rise in the United States with the, for example, prosecution of whistleblowers and um, the intense interest that the security surveillance state has taken in the activities of journalists. And defending against those so that you can publish important work is extremely expensive. And it not only takes good lawyers, but it takes a particular kinds of lawyers, not lawyers who are trying to avoid risk, but lawyers who are trying to find a way to publish. And I know a lot of the new media organizations don't have lawyers like that, and they're increasingly rare at the larger organizations. So that is, that is one problem. Another is campaign coverage, the way we do it in the US, has been broken for a long time and it never gets better. Uh, and despite the well-known criticisms of it, despite what I've said for 20 years, what you've said for many years, there seems to be like a learning disability in our press that just prevents it from improving. A, th a third thing related to that is we hear journalists talk a lot, and today we heard it several times, about the rising importance of analysis in, uh, in the press, which I agree with. I understand why they say that, because um, it's, it's, a, it's a value-added function that they can serve. But analysis doesn't come from nowhere. Analysis can only be of value if you are bringing a body of knowledge to events that that you can systematically analyze. And I think very often when journalists talk about analysis, what they're actually adding just isn't good enough, especially in a era where the people who really know their stuff, real experts, people who've studied problems for a long time, can themselves publish, or to put it another way, the sources can go direct. Uh, and I, I think expertise in journalism has to catch up in a way that perhaps people in the press aren't quite aware of yet, analysis based on what. And finally, um, and this is another area where I think you've done some good work in, in your journalism. There are lots of situations that journalists face where readers know more than they do. The, the knowledge that the readership has is actually greater than the journalists could ever gather. And we're, the press is still not very good at getting that kind of information flowing in to improve their reporting, with the result being that when you really, really know a subject really well and you see a news treatment of it, almost everybody has the same reaction, which is they got it wrong. And I don't think that's good enough. And it just has to stop. It has to be better. So those are still problems in supply that I see that are going to get worse if we don't do something about them. Thank you. Uh, so, Paul Kelly, you have seen 
the evolution and the influence of journalism in Australia for a long time and from very, a very central position. I'll ask the same question to you. Do you think that as judged by its influence on political life, people being able to know what they need to know to do public business, is there an actual problem with today's journalism or is it simply more of the same you've seen for years? Well, I think if we're going to be serious about the analysis, we have to conclude there's a real problem here. We're working in an industry where there's a massive amount of structural change going on. There are grave doubts about the business model. We've lost a lot of journalists in the industry over the course of the last few years. Probably 20, 25% of journalists have gone. I mean, you can't have that sort of change without it affecting the operation of, uh, of uh, newspapers and the media. Uh, essentially, journalists these days are required to do more with less resources. They are under pressure. Essentially, what they've got to do is they've got to produce the traditional product, the traditional paper, at the same time, of course. They are now working on different platforms as part of the overall digital strategy. So there's no doubt at all that we've seen fragmentation of the market, and this has been an extremely difficult time for the industry. Essentially, what's happening is that journalists are trying to do their job at the same time that their own industry is being transformed. There are a number of uh, quite important ramifications of this in terms of politics and public policy and national interest policy. Uh, you can't understand the failure of the Labor government over the last six years without relating it to the, cha to, to the changes going on inside the media industry. Now, just quickly, some of these changes. What, what is happening is we have a far more partisan approach in the media, both in terms of new media and traditional media, in terms of building their own constituencies and their customer loyalty. We have a greater trend towards comment and opinion in media, both in terms of new media and traditional media, simply because there's more pressure and more difficulty and more cost when it comes to journalism. We are increasingly going into a society where there is an unequal uh, sense of information. That is, those savvy will be more aware and have more information than ever before. Those disengaged will be more alienated from the system and more isolated and feel that sense of resentment. And above all, we've got this epic conflict between short-termism, which of course is produced by real-time media, and politicians respond to this by the need for an automatic uh, response, automatic reaction. So this encourages uh, gesture politics, short-termism, whereas the nature of the problem, whether we're talking now about economic restructuring, climate change, demography, the nature of the problem requires sustained long-term solutions. So you've got a real conflict here between the immediate sense of the communication age on the one hand and the nature of long-term political public policy requirements on the other. My final point would be that there is less of a voice for the public interest. Now, of course, you can have a debate about what the public interest is. But essentially, the power of government is weakening in this process of creative destruction. Mm. We're, we're, we're moving from the old industrial age to the new digital age, so the age of uh, big industry, big government, big unions, uh, big corporations is going. There's now a greater focus on individual power, individual rights, reinforced by technology. This means it's more difficult for representative institutions to deliver public policy results. So overall, yes, there's a very substantial difficulty we need to try to come to grips with in both the media and politics and how they relate to one another. Before turning to you, Eric Beecher, to respond to, to that and also this, this, uh, the analysis that, that Paul has offered, I'll say that in the US, the analogs of this would be, for example, the difficulty <coughs> in dealing with budget problems. If you poll the American public, they think that half the federal budget goes to foreign aid, for example, when it's roughly 1%, and it's the sensory organs of democracy are then uh, are, have, have difficulty. 
how do you feel with your experience in the print media and the digital media and public information through the Wheeler Center? How do you see the actual governing problems that the current phase of the press creates? Um, I think there's a, a couple of sort of generic assumptions here. One is when you talk about journalism, that's a very sweeping uh, yeah. sort of description of what goes on. And in fact, uh, I think what we're all concerned about here is a particular kind of journalism, public trust journalism, uh, you know, covering the beats, the investigative journalism, covering politics, courts, that kind of thing. And that is the journalism that really sits uh, within the sort of ambit of what makes a democracy work. So that journalism, and as Paul said, the business models are, or well, the business model is falling apart. That journalism uh, was never profitable. It was right. always unprofitable. It was always subsidised. But because uh, the subsidy uh, was so rich from particularly classified advertising and other forms of advertising, um, proprietors of that kind of journalism were uh, more than happy to cross-subsidise it because there was a lot of prestige attached to that as well, whereas now uh, the funding source is basically disappearing. And that journalism, particularly in a small country like this, where, um, in my view, that kind of journalism in Australia resides, unfortunately, only in about four big newspapers and, and a little bit of the ABC, and uh, those four big newspapers uh, are basically all either losing money or about to lose money. Their revenue uh, has collapsed. And so who's going to pay for that journalism? Um, and I think you could almost argue that maybe the funding of that kind of journalism, uh, which is so fundamental to our democratic system, maybe that funding has actually ended up in the wrong bucket. You know, maybe it should have always been in the ABC bucket or the public library bucket or the arts, public arts funding bucket or something like that, which is anathema to people in commercial media, and I'm in commercial media, but um, that's my concern. So uh, let me see if, if I'm correct in summing up some of one of the, the, the conclusions, the implications both of what you all have said in the last few minutes and most of the discussions today. The point one would be there is a kind of journalistic function that has a public externality role, the investigative reporting, the state house reporting, things that, that are we think of as serious journalism. Point two would be that never has been a standalone business any more than pure education has been. Point three, its existing model for paying for itself is being demolished, and therefore point four some other economic base for this public uh, interest journalism needs to be uh, invented. Is that correct? Paul, do you agree with that? Uh, well, what we see at the moment is a grand experiment, a great endeavour by the existing players, by the current corporations, a uh, process of trial and error, if you like, uh, to try and work out how to manage this challenge and different corporations have tried different routes here. I mean, in this country, for example, we've seen quite different approaches from some of the uh, major companies. Uh, so, um, uh, we can't predict the outcome of this. I mean, essentially what we're seeing is one of the great transitions in history from producer power to consumer power. And consumers have got to think about this. Consumers have got to think about, well, how they exercise their power and their discretion. Are they going to be relaxed about not having a print edition of the Sydney Morning Herald Monday to Friday in three or four years' time? Or how do they wish to exercise uh, other aspects of their uh, consumer power? And essentially what's happening in this process of creative destruction uh, inside the industry, as far as the producers are concerned, they are looking at the consumers and they are trying to find new points of equilibrium which are viable in commercial terms, looking at how we process the information onto different platforms so that people pay for it and we get advertising revenue from the different platforms. Now, this is what's going on now and inside the industry this is taking up the time of a lot of editors and commercial managers. Now, what will happen, I think, at the end of the day is that ultimately, uh, this is, and this is, this is the way markets function, there will be uh, a resolution of some form or other between how we package information, news and journalism in the future at whatever price it is 
given levels of consumer demand. But there will be an answer, there will be some sort of answer and resolution along those lines. And I think while some players will fall away, others will in fact survive. I wonder if it's possible to turn up the house lights for a moment. I just want to do a couple of polls of the audience, of people who have been hearing the discussion, to see, uh, see how, how you're feeling about what we've heard today. And the first question I want to ask is, for people who've heard more than just this one panel, you've heard other discussions today, compared with how you felt when you came into the Opera House this morning, are you more concerned or less concerned about the, the problems of journalism, the, the changes in journalism's business plan and its effect on the governance of your country. You are more concerned because of what you've heard today, raise your hand, and you are less concerned and feel as if there's a self-correcting process. Interesting, I'd say, what, roughly 50-50 or maybe 45-55. The second question would be essentially your, your confidence in whether the thousands of experiments going on at news organizations and governments by news consumers, are these likely to correct the problem over the next five years or make it worse over the next five years? So, so five years from now, will, will this problem of democratic information, public knowledge, will it be better than now or worse than now? Better than now, the situation will be better, worse than now. It's going to be worse. Again, I'd say roughly 50-50, quite, quite interesting. So, so part of the idea in convening this session and hoping it's going to be an ongoing discussion among people from democratic countries uh, around the world is to see whether there are things we can help each other with and mm. learn, uh, learn from each other. Uh, Jay, are there things you have taken from the Australian example you think are remotely applicable in the United States, or do differences of scale, legal regime, and all the rest mean that these are just our different worlds? Well, Australia certainly shows the United States the advantage of having the ABC <laughs> uh, and having an organization that is not only excellent at public broadcasting, but serves as um, a kind of model for others in broadcasting. Uh, and we don't have that. Uh, I wouldn't call our PBS system a leader in journalism in any way. The journalism. But, but NPR. Yes. NPR, yeah. yeah but. Yes, um, they're, they're both good, but they, they suffer from a kind of fragility that um, makes them uh, too timid, I believe, very often. And so just the, the whole idea that there can be um, a national news organization that is supported essentially by the opinion of the Australian people that it ought to exist, which then gets translated into, into taxpayer support. I think that's something that we could, we could definitely learn from. We could learn from, but not um, apply. Not, not, yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen be, for political reasons yeah. in, the, in the United States. In fact, we're going in the opposite uh, direction towards, uh, towards hostility, hostility to public broadcasting. So, uh, let me ask you, Eric Beecher, as a representative of, world, of a world we hope to encompass more in some future iterations of this conference, the, the, the digital media world, the, the tech world, which you have a lot of experience in, do you think either in terms of tools that digital companies are finding to monetize content or simply by by um, philanthropic slash visionary investment in the form of Jeff Bezos or Pierre Omidyar, do you foresee a, a bit more and more constructive or important role of, of the digital world in, in dealing with the public knowledge aspects of journalism? Well, clearly that's happening, but I think to, to sort of look at the comparison, say, between the two countries yeah. that are under discussion here, I actually feel a lot more optimistic about the problem in the US mm. because we're watching the philanthropists move in now on a big scale because philanthropy uh, in the US operates on a big scale, whereas in this country, uh, whether it's pro rata or whether it's even worse than that because the culture of philanthropy is nowhere near as strong, uh, it's inconceivable to think that anyone is going to put, you know, $20 million, mm -hmm. let alone $250 million, yeah. into important news organisations. Um, and so that makes me far less optimistic about Australia. Um, so that even if, and we're all watching these experiments 
Everyone around the world's watching them. Everyone in the States is watching them, obviously. Um, but where you have you know, substantial philanthropists being prepared to take a you know, relatively small slice of their net worth to support what we're talking about here, that's really encouraging. Um, but if you divide that by 10 or 20, that, that ain't going to do it here. And I think there's, there's a scale point that's worth mentioning here. Uh, Jay Rosen was just uh, illustrating something that works better in Australia than in the U.S., which is the ABC. And Eric was talking about the scale advantages that the U.S. has. Here is one really important point that I think we're going to see more and more as some of today's um, economic victors uh, decide to get involved in, in journalism or other public knowledge infrastructures. The amount of money needed to run a serious journalist or, journalistic organization is fairly small by other philanthropic comparisons. This figure I'm about to give is more or less true that if you took the 100th largest college endowment in the United States, and which would be some tens of millions of dollars, that would be enough to support a very serious news organization. And so things, you know, the college, for example, and museums require a lot more capital than news organizations would. So the scale advantages are, are, are there too. Um, Paul Kelly, I'd ask you from observing Australian politicians, do you feel as if their ability to govern wisely is different now because of changes in the media or has it just always been a problem dealing with the public, the press, et cetera? I think it's harder to govern now. Um, certainly, you know, I mean, I've been covering Australian politics for 40 years uh, and I think the environment which has evolved for a number of reasons, but one of the central factors is the media. Uh, I think that makes it uh, harder to govern. I wouldn't want to exaggerated too much, but I'll give this example. I can remember when Paul Keating was treasurer, when he was deregulating the financial system, making a lot of changes. What he could do is he could call six senior journalists down to his office and brief them, or more to the point, the way he did it was to brief them individually over a few days. And essentially, as a result of that process, he was able to get out his economic reform message to an awful lot of the Australian population just through dint of centralised mass media. Now, the Treasurer can't do that today because the marketplace is much more fragmented. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. You could say, well, uh, the more fragmented uh, media is good, um, uh, because it's harder for the politicians to get their message through and uh, thereby we think this is essentially uh, a public sector good. Or you could say, uh, in terms of a government attempting to introduce worthwhile change in the national interest, this is a negative because it's much harder for it to sell its message. So that's a sort of uh, practical example. Uh, I think overall it is more difficult and I think the troubles faced by the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government, as I said <laughs> earlier on, can't, can't be understood without very significant reference to the media environment mm. and essentially the efforts of that government to try to handle and manage that media environment. They thought they were being smart, they weren't, and their tactics ended up being very counterproductive. Finally, just to go to an earlier point you were discussing, I don't think the future for the industry can depend on charity. I think this is a complete delusion. There is a role at the margin. Mm. There is a role at the margin for charity right. and support for public interest journalism, but we are deluding ourselves if we think that is going to be the answer to the problems we face. The answer to the problems we face can only ultimately reside in the marketplace and the generation of profits for this industry. Right, and I, I think, would any of you disagree with that, that charity would be a part of a complex solution, the main part of which is a different market model? I disagree that charity has a minor role. I think there's, it's not just charity, that's, that's, that's a narrow way of putting it, but there's other ways of operating that don't necessarily require profits, certainly that don't necessarily derive from advertising, which I think is another crisis that we haven't really talked about. Advertising itself is being disrupted and transformed. In fact, in a, in a lot of ways, advertising 
is going away because the internet allows buyers and sellers to connect with each other without going through this rather inefficient form of advertising. So I think you know, there's, we have to think more broadly about what we call business models. They're not just business models, sort of any way of sustaining serious work works. And what I think is going to replace a broken business model is a lot of small ways of sustaining journalism and sometimes it's not a business model. Not everything has a business model. What is the business model for chess? <laughs> there is none, but chess goes on because people continue to do it. And I think we, you know, we can't just think about business models narrowly. We have to think about all of the ways society can support the serious work. We have a little less than 15 minutes left. I'm going to invite anybody to come and ask questions to this <coughs> panel or volunteer thoughts you've had about the day's discussion. So while I'm calling you up, so yes, uh, yes, please, go ahead. Politicians are certainly aware of it. I mean, um, you talk to Julia Gillard or Kevin Rudd uh, because they experience this at first hand. Um, all the time, they're concerned every waking day about getting their message out to the people. So they are highly geared uh, to the media, to the challenges the media faces, and they're very frustrated. Uh, they are privately uh, very concerned and frustrated about a lot of the changes going on in the media because they feel that this is having a detrimental effect in its totality on the coverage of politics. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, they think that it's far more difficult in terms of their perspective governing the country uh, to establish the relationship they want with the people and get their message out to the people in terms of selling their government's agenda and setting that agenda. So uh, there's, I don't think there's any doubt that the politicians are very, very focused on it. They're not going to talk about it in public, but in private they are very, very aware of it and a lot of them have got very sophisticated views about, about the media. Um, when it comes to the media itself, well, you know, there's a lot of uh, different views in the media about this, of course, and one of the features of the Australian media in the last few years, of course, has been this tremendous cultural conflict within the media itself uh, about public policy and about national interest priorities for the country. Uh, so you've got a lot of different views within the media uh, about, uh, about the approach to politics and how best to come to grips with these problems. Are the politicians worried at all that the public isn't getting its message through to the politicians? <laughs> Does that concern them at all? Yeah, well, the politicians are, are very obviously focused on what the community thinks. Uh, Australia is a compulsory voting democracy, mm. uh, and this is, this is absolutely fundamental. So, therefore, the politicians can't afford to ignore... Uh, 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the community. Uh, they've got to be uh, uh, putting together uh, packages of policies which respond to these multiple constituencies. And so that's always a substantial challenge uh, uh, for them. Yes. We've heard a lot about the relationship between democratic messaging and the media and how the role of ideology necessarily clashes or intertwines with centrism and its role. Jay spoke about that imperative, particularly in campaign politics. My question is regarding whether or not the panel feels that the role of journalists and journalism more broadly in promoting centrism dialogue is harmed by newspapers or media organisations 
openly endorsing political parties or particular candidates um, while those campaigns are occurring. Uh, Eric, let's start with you. Um, well, I do have a problem with it. Uh, I particularly have a problem with it in a country which is, uh, in which media ownership is so concentrated. So what it means is that, uh, and we saw this obviously happening uh, in recent months during the last election campaign, it means that uh, one company or the other company uh, could and sometimes does um, right across the nation um, uh, not just endorse in the, in the kind of US sense in, in the editorial column, but on its front pages and its news pages. And, uh, you know, you could argue on one hand, as I'm sure they do, that this is just part of the cut and thrust of democracy and isn't that great? Um, and, you know, no one... Uh, I'm not suggesting and people aren't generally suggesting that there be uh, kind of retrospective changes to media ownership, but... Uh, you know, I guess it does get back to, you know, what kind of responsibility do you have if you run or own a media organisation or a journalism organisation? Do you want to add to that, Paul, or not? I'm happy to talk about that. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, well, there are a number of points to make about this. Um, one is, uh, first of all, are people suggesting that uh, in any way this affected the election result? Um, do... Uh, the media, in this sense, lead opinion, or do they follow opinion? It's a fundamental question, absolutely fundamental question. And a lot of the time, the media follow opinion. Um, in that sense, they may operate a little like currency markets. At the end of the day, they might tend to overshoot. Um, uh, what I would say about uh, the previous government is that it had an extremely benign run from most of the media for the first 12 to 18 months. And in fact, it had an extremely benign run from a lot of the media up until June 2010, when the Prime Minister was suddenly replaced. If you'd been reading a lot of the Australian media, you wouldn't have had actually a clue on earth that there was such a crisis going on inside the government and such worry inside the government about Labor's standing and Labor's public policies. Uh, to a large extent, uh, significant sections of the media didn't report that. Now, what I'd say is uh, I would take up Eric's point. I think that when it comes to the tabloids, well, we know there is a crisis in journalism. We shouldn't be surprised that tabloid papers operate like tabloid papers. Um, and uh, frankly, um, uh, there's no point getting out of the audience a lot of people who don't like tabloid papers and expecting that a tabloid paper will correspond or subscribe to their values. If they don't read the paper, they probably don't read the paper because they don't like it. But a lot of the marketplace does like it. Now, we know from time immemorial, certainly in this country, in this country in the last hundred years, newspapers have taken very firm positions in politics one way or another. I would have to say, I think, while it's true that some of the papers in this most recent campaign were particularly strong, I would argue, I would argue that they took their cue from what they saw were their own constituents, in particular in the case of the Telegraph, Western Sydney. And finally, I'd point out the Labor Party primary vote at this election was 33%, the lowest for 100 years. I don't think that was because of the media. I think the media reflected a sentiment very strong in the community. Yes, we have, we'll, we have a few more minutes, so we'll go to a lightning round now. OK. Um, today, the conversation has focused a great deal on the digitalisation of print media and the effect that has had on revenue streams of, of print media. With the integration of internet into television sets, known as smart TVs, and rumours of Apple soon releasing its own fully integrated smart TV set, what future do you see for commercial television news when the business model of free-to-air and cable television, as we know it, is effectively shot? And do you think this on-demand era will lead to a move into models of integrating advertising into news bulletins? Who would like to... Eric, would you like to answer that? Look, I think when it comes to commercial television news, what you're really talking about there is the platform. Clearly, the platforms are changing. 
Um, I get back to where I think we started, certainly where I started in this discussion, which is there are certain kinds of journalism, most of which don't actually occupy much, if any, time of, of commercial television news, that need a lot of money uh, and they're part of the system and they've been traditionally funded by another funding source and that funding source has dried up and that, to me, is the bigger problem. I think that commercial television news uh, will continue in one form or another um, because there's a demand for it. But I don't think that addresses the problem, the seminal problem, confronting journalism. Yes. Um, Paul Kelly mentioned short-termism uh, and we also heard a lot today about the pressures in terms of resources on journalists. Do you think journalists have enough time to think about big issues? Are they thinking enough and... If not, how can they think more? So I'll stipulate the answers. The first two answers are no and no. So how about the uh, J? How can they get? How can they think better? Well, if nobody gives them the time and they are under production quotas that don't allow them to actually know what they're talking about, there's not that much you can do about that, except. We're seeing the emergence of a new model in, in the United States, which I have written about in my blog called the personal franchise uh, model in news, in which it is uh, the expertise and knowledge and reliability of an individual journalist like an Ezra Klein at the Washington Post, who's known for his wonkish knowledge of Washington politics. Um, and so many people rely on him for their news because he knows what he's talking about most of the time that he has become like a franchise within the franchise of the Washington Post. And he is permitted to hire additional young journalists who are like himself um, to have an even larger operation and to do more and to sort of absorb more of the Washington Post's news report. And by allowing Klein to operate this way and to, by surrounding him with more journalists, what the Washington Post is actually doing is a kind of ideological renovation within their operation without having a holy war about it because Klein operates in a different way. He is like a wonk journalist. So that's one way that we can get a more thoughtful press. And there's, I'll allude to one thing at The Atlantic that Jay was mentioning earlier. I found, I've worked for The Atlantic for a very long time, and I found in the last five or six years since we've had a much more active website, although The Atlantic started early 20 years ago, that on any topic I address, I can draw on a thousand correspondents around the world who say, here's what you really need to know about the pork market in Sichuan, and here's what's happened here in the last week. And by yeah. providing a forum for people who have local expertise, it's a different kind of journalism. Yes. Mm -hmm. Over 100 years ago, the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald was full of classified ads. No news whatsoever. The news was a bit of an add-on. Um, as the market changed, editors realised they needed serious journalism and news on the front page to sell them. So it's a bit of a myth about the rivers of gold subsidising. It's more that we need the serious journalism so people keep reading the stuff. Does that suggest that the real model going forward could be like Eric Beach's criteria, it's subscription-based, mm. or it could be like the fact that with the internet you've got a global audience of two billion English readers rather than just your own little suburb or city or nation. Mm. Eric, about Crikey? Um, well, Crikey started uh, a long time ago in the, in the history of the internet, uh, 13 years ago, I think, um, and uh, it, it started with a... It, it, it was started by Stephen Main who depended on the subscription revenue to feed his kids. And so uh, it always had subscriptions, it always built that up, and that's grown. And it also it has a particular kind of voice and personality. So, you know, maybe there's room for one crikey. I mean, it's interesting when you look in the States, you've got uh, Slate and Salon, and they're both really struggling. Um, but you've got much bigger media outlets that aren't struggling to the same extent. They're yeah. all struggling, but, you know. I think the, the problem, I mean, I agree in theory with what Paul says, it would be great if the marketplace could decide, but if the marketplace decides, in my view, about journalism, then it will be cherry-picked journalism and it will only be the journalism uh, that can be supported commercially, either by subscriptions, and that's usually financial kind of personal investment journalism, maybe a little bit of crikey, uh, 
or by <coughs> advertising, and, that's, and, and public trust journalism uh, has always been subsidised. It's right. never actually operated commercially successfully in the marketplace. That's my worry, right. particularly in a small country like this. Jim, and, can I add just yes. one thing on that? I'm not worried that rich and powerful people who run empires aren't going to have news. People who have run things have always had news and they always will because they can amortize the cost of collecting it over the profits they mm -hmm. make in their empires. So we're not talking about whether the people who run the world are going to be informed or not. The, the, the conversation is about whether the broad public will have available to it sufficient news to, pl to play its part as a public. That's what's at stake here. Uh, there's always going to be a news business because there's always going to be people who are willing to pay for it so that they can run their business. And we don't have to worry about them. And that, that is, again, elegantly stating the basic question we're addressing here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, or our last question. Yeah. Um, yeah, coming back to Jay's point, just then, um, even Paul mentioned um, information inequality in terms of how the, just, the savvy are receiving more information um, than the disengaged who are not. So what kind of responses have we seen to that in terms of public interest journalism? And um, could, in terms of a model, perhaps want that be one of the reasons why a lot of ad revenue is being lost? Because if you lose those disengaged people, you're losing your reach and you're losing the views. So. Paul. Well, I think it's a real problem. Uh, I don't pretend to know uh, what the answer is. It goes to the quality of democracy. It's uh, a very bad outcome if you've got um, growing information inequality, and I think that's probably where we are at the moment. But it's compounded by other difficulties as well, uh, and that is that among those who, who are information rich, I think a lot of that debate is increasingly highly partisan, uh, uh, based on uh, opinion, uh, with a decline in the journalistic uh, base. So I think that's a related problem. I think the uh, solution uh, is going to be a multifaceted solution. There's going to be no one-size-fits-all in this arrangement, and that's why it's going to be quite hard to describe what happens. Uh, I think, as I said, there is a limited role uh, for charity. I think that... Um, there's a limited role in terms of taxpayer subsidy. Uh, I think that we have to increasingly look to entrepreneurship in the marketplace at the local level, uh, suburban and local papers. Uh, then look at, um, uh, at uh, the successful integration of more substantial papers in terms of the traditional print product plus the digital arm running in parallel with one another, which of course is what we're very preoccupied with at the moment. So I think essentially you're going to look at a multifaceted arrangement. Okay, here's the agonizing question, Jim. It's, and I think we're going to have to face this in, in the future, and that's why this forum where we can ex essentially experiment with different nations, different polities is really, is really important. But he, here's the thing that we don't know. is. Will national publics choose to live in the present? Because I think increasingly, it's not going to be the supply side that answers this big question, but the demand side. And if, if people don't actually choose to inform themselves, choose to live in the present, then we're not going to have publics that can grapple with real problems. And in the past, that was kind of solved in a, in a rough way by a limited media universe. We don't have that universe anymore. And so, so it's bigger than where are the journalists going to come from and what's the business model for the news. It really comes down to, to societies choosing whether they want to inhabit the moving present. <laughs> That's the only way I can put it because it's so... It's so basic to our understanding of what democracy is. But we don't know that people will choose that. Well, I think that point's right. And it goes to what I said, that I think this is, this is the transition from the producer model to the consumer model, which we've seen in other parts of the economy. 
over the course of the last 25 or 30 mm. years, which we understand to be uh, the sort of pro-market economic reform, but hey, this transition is now going on right inside the media industry right now. And that's why I say the focus has got to be on the consumer and the individual. They have the power now. Now, how are they going to exercise it? What sort of values are they going to bring to bear? Are they going to be a diligent citizen who is interested, as Jay says, in living in the present and informing themselves, but making the effort to do that? Uh, who does that? How do they do it? What products they look for? How much they pay? These are all the questions. And then what happens to that segment of the community that doesn't want to do it? Eric, this is your, do you have any final word before I give my benediction? <coughs> um, I'll just go back to Jay's comment when he was comparing the two countries and talked about the presence of the ABC here that, and just say what a disastrous debate and discussion this would be if we didn't have the ABC. So with that, I have 90 seconds between right now and when you all can go out to the cocktail reception out there. I wanted to thank first our excellent panelists on this last group and all of them today and, and yesterday too, Australian, American, Canadian, and otherwise. I think they all have done, given their best. And this has been wonderful. So please join me in thanking our panelists. I, I want to be clear again to thank our two main sponsors, the government of New South Wales, which has been very generous in sponsoring this event, and the U.S. Study Center with Bates Gill, Sean Gallagher, Andrea Koch, Tom Switzer, Amy Deadmead, and everybody else there who has done such a wonderful job in pulling this, this event t together. I also wanted to say something about, uh, I'm going to use a little analogy about the hope I have for this, this operation. I've spent a lot of my life over the last seven years in China. And one of the, the themes I've been involved there has been China-US collaborations on environmental issues, because the environment is China's worst problem. It's the worst problem for itself and its impact on the rest of the world. And week by week, month by month, there are very, very intimate collaborations between scientists and, and public health officials and other kinds of um, private and public organizers from China and the US who meet all the time to try to find ways to learn from each other's uh, problems, to try to uh, see how they can address these issues that are so important for China and for its effect on the rest of the world. And the situation in China is bad now, but it would be much worse were it not for that kind of collaboration. And people have gone to great lengths to keep those, those connections and those networks going, especially of a next generation of Chinese and American international scientists who tried to work on these problems. So too, when it comes to issues of the media, the environment in a, a different sense in which our, our government works. I think that there is a lot we have to learn from each other. There are other groups we can involve from the technology community, from people inside government, from young, uh, young uh, civic activists from, from around the world. So I hope very much that we'll look back on this first installation of this conference is the beginning of the sort of network which helps us all deal with these, these uh, challenges and issues. Thank you all for your attention today. Thanks to all of our sponsors, and I'll see you out on the foyer.